vâng, xin cảm ơn bác sĩ Nguyên ạ. À. À, tiếp theo chương trình sẽ là phần trình bày của bác sĩ, giáo sư bác sĩ Aris, giới thiệu trí thông minh nhân tạo trong siêu âm sản khoa. Xin được kính mời bác sĩ Aris ạ. À. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I always uh, like to start a slide with a picture of where I would have been if it wasn't for the pandemic and show them my favorite scene of that country. And my favorite scene in Vietnam is definitely the people of Vietnam. So I'm really sorry not to be there with you in person. And I really hope that perhaps next year I can be. My name is Aris. I'm an obstetrician and a fetal medicine specialist. And I have a special interest in using artificial intelligence in ultrasound. So I will be talking about that a little bit today, and then we'll give a practical demonstration straight after this talk. And before I start, I just wanted to make clear that I'm a co-founder uh, and I, I still work as a consultant for Intelligent Ultrasound. And Intelligent Ultrasound is a spin-out company from the University of Oxford. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Intelligent Ultrasound is working really, really closely with GE in developing software and AI systems to improve ultrasound. I also uh, receive a number of grants, including the National Institute for Health in the UK, the Oxford Biomedical Research Center, a number of other US and European research councils, foundations and charities, and that's my declaration of interest. When we learn from a picture or an image, there's broadly speaking two different ways of doing it. One is using so a fairly standard or old fashioned geometrics, okay? So let's say we want to recognize a cat and we might say, well, in order to recognize a cat, you have triangular ears and you have some eyes and a nose that's of a particular shape. And in this kind of relationship, uh, if you see that relationship, then you should conclude that this is a cat. And that works pretty well uh, for cats that behave themselves uh, like these two. They look straight at you and they have nice pointy ears uh, and that's great. But some cats don't behave. Some cats may be lying upside down or they may not have pointy ears at all. They might have a hand in front of the face or their eyes closed. Your child would recognize this as a cat even though it's from the back and that kind of system would not. Your child would even recognize this as a cat uh, and you can't see very much of it at all, but it's still clearly a cat. How can we replicate better using computers how humans learn? Because humans don't learn like that example I showed you. You don't tell your daughter, oh, this is a cat because it's got triangular ears and a round eyes and a funny nose. You teach your children by seeing lots of examples of pictures every day and telling the child, look, a car, look, a dog, look, a cat. And this is what machine learning does. It uses what we call big data, lots and lots of pictures, for example, here of cats and dogs. And those data need to be labeled so that the computer can learn. And the computer learns based on features, based on textures, based on parts of objects so that you can recognize even the cat in the box. And then it classifies the object. And the computers learn through a system of what we call convoluted neural networks, which actually replicate very much how we learn in practice, how we learn in our brain. And in the same way that it's quite difficult to explain how your child learns what a cat is, it is actually quite difficult to explain how this works. We don't really understand exactly why by trial and error, images end up in one category or the other, but they do. Once you have taught the algorithm to understand what a cat is, you then give it a new image, a new image that it hasn't seen before. And then uh, that new image that it hasn't seen before is examined for those textures and, uh, and, and uh, other features and correctly identified. 
And you can do this with natural images, we call natural images, everyday images, photographs around the world. And there's a, a database of images taken from the internet of 15 million images, and they've been categorized by humans into 21,000 categories, cat, dog, car, truck, tree, whatever. And every year there's a competition to see whether humans or machines are better at classifying these images. And you can see here the error of computers in classifying the images back in 2010. One in three images were wrongly classified, but by 2016, um, computers only misclassified 3% of images. And this was a very crucial year because that was the year that definitively showed that computers can categorize images better than humans. In other words, the error rate of the computer was lower than the error rate of a human. And this has led to a machine learning algorithms that allow us to recognize cars or planes. Uh, and these are crucial elements for self-driving cars. Uh, also in nature, it can recognize bears, for example, uh, to allow counting. And of course, we all are aware of the surveillance nature um, that this brings, and this has also some ethical disadvantages. So how can we use some of this technology in imaging, and in particular in ultrasound, and this is our group at Oxford, we've been working for a number of years to try to improve ultrasound imaging. So AI and medical imaging, like in natural process imaging, benefits from two things. One is a huge explosion in data and imaging data in particular, imaging data in healthcare. Um, so in because of digitalization, we expect in 2020, the data not out yet, to have 40 zettabytes of um, data uh, of, 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 of digital data, huge amount of data. The second thing is that computers are getting faster and faster because the number of transistors on microchips doubles about every two years. So bringing these two things together allows us with large libraries of good images and good strong clinical understanding and ensuring completely correct network topology, or in other words, methods for machine learning, bringing those three things together allows us to learn based on machines. Look at this example. This is an abdominal circumference. This, is, uh, this mask in red and green and blue was placed by a manual observer. And here on the right is a computer that's going to learn. And it's going to learn, I've compressed here, 100,000 or so uh, steps into a few minutes, just to show you how it starts with lots of errors. And then as it gets more and more data on this test image, the computer algorithm is being taught and it's getting better and better and better at recognizing those key features. And you can see it's already very good and really coming close to approaching manual segmentation. So this was the error rate up here, and you can see that over a number of many cycles, having to been taught on many images, it becomes uh, better. So can we use this to improve our screening for fetal abnormalities, which we know is not brilliant? And often when an abnormality is missed, the problem is not that the person has seen the abnormality and not recognized it. Actually, more often than not, the problem is that the, 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 the picture wasn't looked at. So, you know, the baby is born uh, missing a hand, for example, they look back at the images and there is no picture of the hand. The sonographer forgot to take a picture. Or if they took a picture, it's not a very good picture. So the idea in this was to use uh, the concept of peer review and using peer review uh, automatically in order to keep track of the images, okay? So lots of organizations say we should do peer review, uh, but also they recognize that peer review is really difficult. And because of that, ACR says peer review is voluntary. The JCAHO says you should do it, but you only need to do it on a small random percentage. And it's also true that we don't really know 
uh, a lot about the reliability and reproducibility of these systems. So in my view, peer review systems have to be simple, have to have minimal effects on regular flow, workflow, and demonstrate benefits straight away. So the question here was, could we support a sonographer by automatically keeping a track of the acquired images, by automatically recognizing the images, but also checking that the images are fit for purpose, they are good enough for a screening program standard. In other words, replace a human peer reviewer. And this is what I'll be showing you today in the live scan. I'll just show you a short example here just to explain it. This is Sonolist, and this is Sonolist here on the right. And I've frozen the image, and Sonolist has recognized that that was a profile and has ticked that off. I'm going to scan here. Sonolist is going to recognize this as a face, and it's ticking it off. Okay, I'm not doing anything. The AI system is purely running in the background. And as I'm scanning, the moment I freeze an image, the system recognizes it's an AC, the system recognizes it is kidneys, and therefore it, it keeps a track of those images so that at the end of the scan, I make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Okay. Now, one thing is to see the AC. Another thing is to make sure that it's of adequate quality. Like in this case, you can see that we have all the quality criteria here. So the next version of uh, Sonolist does exactly this. So it looks not only at you've got an AC, but it looks at you've got an AC and it's a really good AC. And you can do the same for any image. You can look at the nose and lips and create criteria of quality for nose and lips, and so on. So here we go, profile. Again, it's working in the background. It's ticked it off, but also you can see all the criteria have gone green. So it's going to give it a green tick here, the face. Look what happens here as I spool forward and backward. Those go gray and green again as the image does a real-time analysis of the images. Um, now, many people tell me, Aris, if an AI system means I have to press a lot of buttons, that makes more, my life more difficult, not easier. And, and this is why this is so important. This completely runs on the back. So you're just doing your normal scan, your regular scan. This just runs in the background, and you don't really need to interfere with it. Only if you end exam and you forgot the kidneys, there'll be a little message saying, have you forgotten the kidneys? You can override that, of course, if you've seen the kidneys and uh, the system hasn't recognized it. But it gives you that warning in the same way that my clinical fellow in the room leans over my shoulder sometimes and says, Professor, you forgot to look at the kidneys. And that does happen in a busy clinical environment sometimes. So this is how the system is designed. And we've tested the system to look whether it performs as well or worse than an experienced sonographer. And the answer is that it does perform as well. Um, if you look at the completeness of the scan, is the scan complete? Then the system uh, agrees um, as much as two experts agree. And if you look at image quality, it also agrees. Uh, the computer agrees with a sonographer as much as another sonographer agrees with a sonographer. I just wanted to very briefly touch on another research line that we're continuing as well, which is supporting better care in low-income settings where ultrasound is not available. Um, as you probably know, the WHO recommends uh, ultrasound exams during pregnancy, and the main aims of these are to check for fetal viability, fetal number, coronicity in the case of multiple pregnancy, estimate gestational age, measure fetal size, and look for major abnormalities, as well as placental appearance and location. And the problem is that this can be difficult, and there's two main difficulties. One is lack of equipment, and the second is lack of staff. And the lack of equipment is getting better because of low-cost ultrasound probes, but the lack of trained staff and lack of training, unfortunately, is something that is still a problem. And what we wanted to see is whether we could use AI to fast track some of that by using AI to help train more people um, as a more scalable solution than sending lots of people out into the field. 
but also to see if we can make basic ultrasound a little easier. And here we have a system where the uh, midwife just simply takes a short video of the head and the AI system recognizes this is a head circumference, measures the head and measures the cerebellum in order to uh, estimate gestational age in the second and third trimester in women who approach healthcare for the very first time in their pregnancy. And here, I think of the concept here of a simple sweep through the abdomen, a simple clinical sweep through the abdomen, a series of axial images where you can really see that this baby's cephalic, you can see where the placenta is, you can see lots and lots of things. Um, interpret that with AI, then you have the maternal bladder, the head, abdominals, the spine, placenta. So the AI system, this runs in the background again, can recognize some of those images. And what it can do is give some automated clues to the sonographer to say, look, if you've done your standard sweeps, uh, and this is our protocol that we use, if you do these standardized sweeps, I can tell you whether the baby is cephalic or breech. I can tell you if the placenta is high or low. I can take some basic measurements of amniotic fluid. I can take some basic measurements of um, uh, fetal uh, biometry and, of course, tell you if the fetal heart is beating. Uh, we've been recruiting lots of volunteers for this project and have now streamlined the protocol and created a huge library of images uh, in order to create uh, these pregnancy risk assessment algorithms based on an automated uh, set of sweeps. And of course, uh, we need a clinically robust risk stratification. So it's not just about ultrasound, it's about integrating ultrasound with clinical information, just as a very basic example. Why does it need to integrate with clinical information? Um, placenta, low placenta, 20 weeks, not relevant. Low placenta, 37 weeks, highly relevant. Low placenta, 28 weeks in someone who's bleeding, also highly relevant. So depending on the clinical scenario and gestational age, the same information needs to be interpreted in a different way. And of course, the aim is to obtain these sweeps easily, not just by the top doctors who actually should be doing their proper doctoring, but perhaps de-skilling some of the people who do these very basic examinations. Not a replacement for formal ultrasound, but a replacement for no ultrasound at all. Artificial intelligence is already part of our daily life. It's a prominent source of innovation in healthcare. I think that AI in healthcare has huge potential. It can improve diagnosis, treatment prioritization, and provide information to doctors to make good clinical decisions. Deep learning, which is part of artificial intelligence, is in particularly good at image recognition. And as I've shown you, it's often as good as humans. Uh, and what we've been showing today is that we're building systems to support sonologists during screening through peer review, but also through automated recognition for very basic ultrasound and in future, for sure, aid in anomaly detection. I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. And I'd really like to thank GE, not just for supporting this program, but really for supporting us in taking these uh, sometimes pretty crazy ideas and concepts into ultrasound systems that are available today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.